Bienvenidos a la noche cósmica de la oveja eléctrica aquí en Canal 22, en donde vamos a conversar con el destacado físico italiano Carlo Robelli sobre la estructura del universo. La gran pregunta que hace Robelli es si somos cosas como piedras o nos parecemos más bien a una red de besos, de sucesos. Carlo Robelli es considerado por la revista Foreign Policy como uno de los 100 más destacados pensadores del planeta. Es uno de los pioneros en la teoría de la gravedad cuántica y autor de varios libros de física moderna traducidos en más de 41 lenguas, entre ellos El orden del tiempo. En la segunda parte de la conversación que sostuvimos, Robelli nos describe una imagen del universo en donde el mundo que investigamos, desde las partículas subatómicas hasta las estrellas, se mueve en una escenografía que no es la de un lienzo fijo. Se trata más bien de un tejido que se explica en términos de sus intercambios e interrelaciones como besitos cósmicos. You describe uh, uh, physics as a net of meetings and interchanges a dense web of interactions. You give us a beautiful image. The world is made of networks of kisses and not from stones. Please open up this image for us. Yes, uh, it is an image which uh, it's important for me at various levels. First of all, um, in, the, in the physics, Of, of the 18th and 19th century, it seemed that uh, um, we could describe the world with just particles moving in space and forces between them. So uh, you just make a list of all the particles and how they move and how they, uh, they, they push and pull one another, and, and that's it. But this does not work. Uh, the physics of the 20th century has changed that in, in death strongly and has shown that that's, the world is not like that. It's definitely not like that. Um, first of all, space and time are much more complicated than just a sort of canvas fixed on which things move. Yes, yes. They, yes. Are, part, they are part of the game themselves. But more importantly, quantum mechanics uh, uh, has modified... Uh, Uh, the way we think about reality in a much stronger way. Because uh, quantum mechanics tell us that the systems, um, this is my understanding of quantum mechanics, uh, a system, a physical system, an object, a pen, is not to be understood in isolation as having properties. The property of the pen is uh, the way it interacts with the rest. Uh, and quantum mechanics tell us that we, uh, it has... Some properties interact in some way, different properties interact in different ways. So you cannot consider the pen without its, its uh, being emerged in whatever is around. Um, and it's more than that. Pen, uh, it didn't, this is a pen, and if I wait three seconds, it's still a pen. So we tend to identify the pen three seconds earlier or three seconds later at the same pen. But is it the same pen? Well, it's the same pen because it looks very much like that. <laughs> uh, but it's really, it's really a different thing, which uh, it's a phenomenon evolving in time, a series of things evolving in time, which is particularly monotonous and, and, and always the same, so we call it pen. It's like a wave in the, in the ocean, right? We see a wave moving, you say, well, this is a wave, the same wave, that's the same wave, but in which sense is the same wave, right? It's just water that goes up is not the same water. It's just something similar to what happened before and later. So the way to think about the world, in my opinion, and uh, uh, this is what I, I believe uh, modern physics is telling us, is not as objects with properties, but a series of events uh, Uh, affecting one another and existing one because of the other. So a network of reciprocal interactions. This is the deep picture of reality that physics is providing. And I think that this is also the right way of thinking about ourselves and our knowledge and our ideas about the world. We are, in, we keep interacting with one another. You and I are having a conversation. A listener is uh, listening to us and getting something from this conversation. 
And what matters is exchange, is what we tell one another. Not me as a, uh, my own knowledge in myself is, is, is useless unless it is interaction with, with else. And everything we know comes from exchange with people who think different from us, books that uh, tell us things that we didn't know, uh, think we were watching on television or whatever that, uh, uh, that changes our, our way of thinking. So we live in this uh, continuous exchange, which the more it is rich, the more it is wide, uh, and uh, the better it is, the more it enriches us. So even our science, I believe, is that. Our science is uh, the conceptual structure that we build uh, in this continuous exchange between us and with nature, because an experiment is, is again an interaction between us and nature, and we learn something, we, we exchange something. Todo está en intercambio continuo. Heráclito de Feso decía que la verdadera sabiduría consiste en saber que todo está comunicado con todo. Todo nos afecta, nos decía mi profesor Froilán López Narváez. El problema es cómo nombrar ese flujo que se escapa a los conceptos estereotipados. Esto requiere de una nueva gramática para nombrar los mundos inéditos que investiga la ciencia. De ello hablaremos después del corte. Mientras tanto, pasamos a una sección que nos abre a los nuevos escenarios de la tecnología con nuestra querida compañera Aura López. Pues querida Aura, como siempre, un gusto encontrarnos aquí en Oveja Eléctrica. Gracias, Pepe, un gusto estar acá. Oye, fíjate que la ciencia y la tecnología ayudan en diferentes campos de la vida, pero también en el béisbol. Sí, el béisbol y el entretenimiento, porque la cápsula que les traigo ahora habla un poco sobre cómo una tecnología que se desarrolló para el cine, para películas como Matrix, Kong o cualquiera donde tuvieras que usar motion capture, que motion capture es justo esta tecnología donde te ponen sensores para saber tus movimientos, pudiera integrarse al deporte. Esta fue la idea que tuvo el laboratorio de inmersión del MIT, que se encarga de hablar de temas relacionados con realidad virtual, realidad aumentada, y lo que ellos tratan de explicar es cómo esta tecnología podría ayudar a los beisbolistas y al deporte. A los beisbolistas en este caso es porque dicen que para que un pitcher se aprenda el movimiento de andar pichando, tienen que pasar como 10,000 veces, tiene que hacer el movimiento 10,000 veces hasta que logra aprender la jugada. Y cuando usan esta tecnología Motion Capture, se dan cuenta de cómo puede hacer los movimientos, se van dividiendo los colores ya sea por la presión que está ejerciendo en el piso, cómo tiene las caderas, cómo tiene los brazos, la aceleración. Son cosas que normalmente damos por hecho y esta tecnología podría ayudarles también a mejorar sus jugadas y que haya muchas menos lesiones eh, pues relacionadas en el ámbito deportivo. Esto quiere decir que vamos a tener mejor picheo, pero el problema es que también yo creo que se va a aplicar esta tecnología para el bateo y vamos a quedar iguales. <risa> Eso es muy cierto, Pepe, muy cierto. Como siempre, te agradecemos tu presencia aquí en La Oveja Eléctrica. Gracias querida. a ti, Pepe. Muchas gracias, querida Aura. En un parpadeo cósmico, volvemos a La Oveja Eléctrica para seguir conversando con el destacado físico Carlos Robelli sobre un universo que desafía a nuestra imaginación y a nuestra capacidad de nombrarlo. Como de rayo con tintes verdes y dorados que tejen una red de conocimiento e imaginación, estamos de regreso en la noche cósmica de la oveja eléctrica, aquí, en Canal 22, en donde estamos conversando con el destacado físico italiano Carlo Robelli sobre los límites de nuestro lenguaje para entender la realidad. Robelli dice que pensamos el mundo en términos de objetos, cosas, entidades a las que en ciencia se les denomina sistemas físicos, que van desde un fotón o un gato hasta un niño, un planeta o un conjunto de galaxias. Pero estos no existen en aislamiento, están en un cambio continuo al que nuestros conceptos deben adaptarse. You, you were talking about the humbleness needed to do science. Let's talk about the insufficiency of grammar and our brain to grasp time, space, and the quantum world. We have a, a myopic 
a short-sighted nature that is not tuned to deal with atoms and galaxies. How are our scientific curiosity can change this? I think that uh, um, the, the, you put it correctly, Grammar. Our science is not um, just learning new things. I didn't know it was like that. I learned it is like that, uh, period. It's something much deeper. It's uh, a continuous change of, of the concept that we use for describing the world. We, every time we um, learn something and science makes a step, but also every time we as, you know, I'm a kid and become an adult and I learn something, um, what is really going on is that we change the way we, 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 we frame the world, we view the world. We change the language that we use for describing the world. Uh, words have different meanings. Um, and we get deeper. So the progress of science is a progress in changing um, the, 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 the meaning of the world that we use to describe reality and making more complex. For instance, when uh, we discover that the earth is round, right? Then up and down mean different things because uh, uh, in Mexico or in Europe, up it's two different directions, right? Um, or when we discover that the earth moves with Copernicus and goes around the sun, uh, we change the meaning of moving because am I moving? No, I'm not moving, but yes, I'm also moving in a different sense. And we rearrange the universe from earth, uh, celestial bodies to something else, stars, planets, satellites. So we completely rearrange the, the way we think about reality. And, and the discovery of atoms was another rearrangement of our reality. And quantum mechanics and general relativity, once again, are a deep modification of what we mean by space, time, by physical system. Uh, so sometimes it's the grammar that is missing for understanding something, something new. We see it in the past. There is some text in an uh, ancient text um, many centuries ago that says, um, you know, people, the other side of the earth uh, are up when they are down and their down is up. And it, you read it is total nonsense because they're just people struggling to use the, the, the words up and down in a more relative way. And we are the same. We get confused about quantum mechanics because we use our grammar. We say, oh, a particle has a position, has a velocity, but th that's not the right grammar for talking about the universe. We have to change our way of thinking about reality. And that's the best aspect of science, I think. When uh, it, it, uh, it challenges us and it tells us, uh, look, you're just thinking things wrong. Uh, forget about that. It's a better way of thinking about reality. El gran reto es adaptar nuestro pensamiento, nuestro lenguaje, a la lógica de la naturaleza que funciona más allá de nuestros sentidos. Nuestra percepción hace que nos veamos como objetos delimitados y aislados, pero la ciencia, más allá de las apariencias, revela una densa red de interacciones en la que estamos inmersos. Esto implica también cambiar la gramática para pensar el tiempo. Mientras tanto, vamos a una sección que nos abre a otros lenguajes para entender los mundos de la informática con nuestro querido doctor Morsa, el físico Manuel López Micheloni. Pues querido Morsa, como siempre un gusto platicar aquí contigo en La Oveja Eléctrica sobre temas que a veces son escabrosos en términos de informática. Sí, eh, Pepe, fíjate que, que recibo acá a rato, ya es sistemático, o sea, cada tercer día recibo algún correo de alguien que dice que es un super hacker, ¿no? Y le pues digo, ya, y un colega. ¿no? <risa> Pienso, aquí tengo un colega. Este, y dice que, eh, que tiene control sobre mi computadora, sobre mis datos, sobre mi video, y que me ha grabado eh, viendo sitios interesantes. ¿no? <risa> y, que, este, y para demostrarme que efectivamente sabe todo eso, me dice, tu contraseña es tal en tu correo. ¿No? Eso es para probar que ellos tenían control, ¿no? Y entonces, de rescate... ¿no? Para, que yo, para que no hablen y no manden a todos mis contactos esos videos este, comprometedores, eh, tengo que mandarles bitcoins, que no son trazables. 
¿no? se mandan a un número de cuenta en wallet de Bitcoin, en una, una cuestión tecnológica de, de estas monedas criptográficas, y, este, y ya entonces nunca más me van a molestar, porque son muy, muy, este, muy éticos, los, los ladrones éticos, ¿no? Entonces... Que no tienen esa información, pues, por es supuesto, la verdad. Por es, supuesto que no la sí, tienen, sí, sí. ¿no? Te están tratando de hacer que muerdas el anzuelo. Exactamente, ¿no? Y yo he recibido telefonemas de amigos que me dicen, oye, me llegó esto, ¿qué voy a hacer? Le digo, pues no hagas nada, o sea, ¿qué quieres hacer? ¿Les vas a pagar? No, ¿verdad? O sea, por ejemplo, si la gente ve sitios interesantes, por llamarlos de alguna manera... Es legal al final del día, no está haciendo nada, na, nada ilegal. Ahora, que moralmente eh, hay gente que, que se siente aludida por eso, bueno, es otra discusión, pero no, hay, no es nada ilegal. ¿no? Y entonces, ante ese argumento de la moral y de que, que te van a señalar que eres un pervertido y que quién sabe qué, y que haces puras cochinadas, entonces págame y yo ya me voy a olvidar de ti, voy a borrar todo, te lo prometo. ¿Ah? No, ¿Cuál es la lógica? Sí. Y bueno, querido Morsa, creo que nos queda entonces un tema pendiente para otra emisión de La Oveja Eléctrica, que es el secuestro real de la información en las computadoras. De eso ese, hablaremos pronto. Ese, ese sí es grave. Pues como siempre, te agradecemos tu presencia aquí en este espacio. Gracias, Pepe. Muchas gracias, querido Morsa. En un parpadeo cósmico volvemos a La Oveja Eléctrica para seguir conversando con el físico Carlos Robelli sobre el misterio del orden del tiempo. Como de rayo con tintes verdes y dorados que trata de alumbrar los misterios del tiempo, estamos de regreso en la noche cósmica de la oveja eléctrica, aquí en Canal 22. Estamos conversando con el destacado físico italiano Carlos Robelli, autor del libro El orden del tiempo y el problema de nuestros conceptos, de nuestra gramática para nombrarlo. El físico Gerardo Herrera me comentó en una ocasión que, por ejemplo, cuando pensamos en el futuro, lo concebimos espacialmente de frente a nosotros y el pasado a nuestras espaldas. Esto está influido por los lenguajes indoeuropeos. Pero hay otras culturas, como los amairas de los Andes en Bolivia, que lo ven al revés. El pasado está enfrente porque es lo que ya ha sido visible, y el futuro es lo que está a nuestras espaldas porque lo desconocemos. ¿Cómo se piensa el tiempo en la física contemporánea y cómo se procesa en nuestros cerebros y en nuestras vidas? And we have also to change the, our grammar of what time means. Time uh, has fascinated me. I've written a book about time. And uh, uh, the, the, the discovery about time in the last century, the discoveries, plural, about time in the last century have been many and, and very surprising. We have an idea about time, a, 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 an instinctive sense of time, right? It's the present, the past, the future. Time is a long line. It's, you know, yesterday, the day before. The, it's this long line. We flow along this long line. The past is fixed. The future is open. Everything I said is wrong. <laughs> That's not the way time works. <laughs> time works in a very different manner. And this, which I have given, is the it's time for us, time at our scale. It's good for our everyday life, of course, uh, but it's not a good way of thinking about time. Uh, if we think about the universe, galaxies, or we think about atoms, uh, and, and, and uh, even less if we think about quantum gravity. As we said at the beginning, the equation that Bryce David and John Wheeler wrote uh, does not have a time variable at all, because time, what we usually usually called time, time of our life, emerges only as an approximation um, out of many happenings in, in the small, which cannot be organized in a single dance, in a single rhythm, a single, um, a single time. So we, we slowly learn, step by step, to change our intuitions. The simplest step is the following. We know now, for, as a fact, that time passes at different speed uh, for different people. So, uh, in fact, in the mountains, there is a, a little bit uh, more time than in the valley. If you have two um, clocks, you put one up and wait a little bit in the mountain, you come down and the one up indicate more time than the one down. 
So there's really less time uh, down near the ocean than up in the hills around Mexico City. So um, it's small, small, but it can be measured, it's real, it's a fact. So this is an example. So uh, time works differently than our intuition. Yes, and, and, and this uh, it takes, on to, it takes us into the direction of trying to understand it with entropy, thermic activity, but also with memory. Uh, and uh, here we have something very interested, interesting in, in what we feel as our sense of time and the problem to define what is present, for example, as seen in music. Let's talk about this mystery of time, of what is present and how it relates to our memory. Yes, um, our in intuition of time, our experiential time, what we call time for us, uh, um, it's strongly affected by the fact, by how our brain works. And we make a mistake if we think that this is a property of, of, of the physics outside there instead of being something that depends on the specific physical object, which our brain. Um, and uh, the first to realize that uh, long ago was St. Augustine, um, mm. who uh, first noticed uh, that uh, um, we live in some sense, not in the present, but also in the past and in the future. And he um, wrote about music. And he said, when you, when you listen to a musical song or a phrase, a musical phrase, uh, uh, if you think for a moment, every single moment you're listening to one note. So wh where, is the, where, is the, where is the musical phrase? Okay, <laughs> you, never, you never hear it. Okay, why do we hear a musical phrase? Well, of course, because we have memory. And anticipation. So we, we remember what came before, exactly, and not just memory, because what our brain does, and in fact, all of neuroscience modern neuroscience is confirming that very much. What our brain does constantly is to use memory to try to guess what's come next. So we constantly anticipate what, what come next. So we leave, uh, we, we humans or we animals, because I, I suppose a cat is the same or a, a, a bird is the same because they also sing songs. Um, we live in the past, in the present, in the future, because we live between memories and anticipation. In fact, little in the present. We, we really live in the past and, and in the future. We constantly have a memory of what has just happened a moment ago, or maybe yesterday, or maybe years ago, or maybe, maybe you study histories centuries ago. Um, and we, we, we constantly are worried about the future because this is our nature to try to, you know, we need to eat, we need to do things, we need to, 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 to do our things in life, uh, realize our ideals, whatever. So we live in this way. And for us, this is time for us, this window of past and future. But of course, this is not time for a clock, a mechanical clock. Okay, a clock doesn't have memory, doesn't remember its previous, what it did yesterday, and has, doesn't care about the future. So we should not project on the clock our sense of flowing time or memory, and we should separate the, the aspect of temporality, which are those of the clock, from the aspect that depend on our, or the way our brain uh, works, our, uh, our mind. So I think that um, this is a general lesson, namely, we should not think that time is a single entity. We should break it up in the various components uh, that makes it. Um, and uh, what is time for our experiential time uh, is not the same thing as a time of clock. Of course, it's related. It's not unrelated. There, there, there's some, something in common, uh, but it's a much more rich experience for us. And that's why we have a sense of time going fast, going slow. Um, uh, we have uh, a, a uh, it senses sometimes for us, uh, time slows down, never passes, sometimes it passes very fast. This has nothing to do with the physical time. It has to do with the, 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 the time of our experience, uh, which is collecting information, the speed at which we collect information. 
if you want, something, something like that. And time is, is complex, it's all this complexity. Uh, it is a very, very beautiful problem because once you go into physics, you keep also doing this game. You say, okay, this is an aspect of time, but it's not a universal aspect of time. It's in this domain, if I look more far away, I lose some aspect of time. Um, and if you go the other way, the complexity of our experience, you realize that the, our experiential time is also uh, complex. And it's also emotional, right? Because uh, time for us is not a neutral thing because we want things and we lose things because we die. We, we, so time for us is a, is a source of emotions. We are time machines, time machines. That's what we are in a sense. But the time for us is not the click of the clock. It's a much more complex thing. Como nos dice el físico Carlos Robelli, el tiempo para nosotros es una fuente compleja de emociones. Poetas como Renato Leduc nos advierten que el tiempo siempre dice, te lo dije. Está ligado a nuestros amores, desamores y dramas. Un minuto antes o un minuto después hace la diferencia en nuestros destinos. En la siguiente emisión de La Oveja Eléctrica, Finalizaremos esta conversación con el físico italiano Carlo Robelli y hablaremos sobre los intrigantes movimientos de los tiempos cósmicos y los tiempos que aparecen en el canto. Por ejemplo, en el tiempo de El tonto de la colina, de esa maravillosa canción que nos hace ver más allá de nuestros adormecidos ojos cotidianos. Y es hora de los cantos cuánticos con nuestro querido Fernando Rivera Calderón, en donde el tiempo se mueve al compás misterioso de la música. No soy yo, no eres tú, no es él, ni el ayer, somos todos, somos todos. No se puede pensar que va solo. Somos todos, somos todos.